Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Teaching Flannery O'Connor, an online professional development seminar from America in Class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Before we get underway, let me take a minute or two just to introduce you to the National Humanities Center. We are located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. We are the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. Let me take a moment to explain what that means. First of all, we are independent. That means we're a private nonprofit organization. We're an institute for advanced study, which means the main program we offer here is a fellowship program that brings scholars to this to the center from this country and abroad to study and research and write on topics in the humanities, subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978. We've had about 1,300 scholars pass through our doors, and as a result of research done here, they have published about 1,300 books. The place may seem like an ivory tower. I mean, all that scholarship is pretty esoteric. And as you can see from these pictures, it looks like an ivory tower. We even have a white spiral staircase running right up through the middle of our white building. But the place was never intended to be an ivory tower. The founders wanted it to collect, connect rather, with a lot of other audiences. And we were particularly interested in connecting with teachers. And we do that in a wide variety of ways these days. If you want to find out how we do that, Go to americainclass.org. That URL will take you to this page. And from this page, you can gain access to all of the resources and programs the National Humanities Center offers for teachers. Now, after our seminar this evening, if you want to find a recording of our program or you want to go to the PowerPoint, uh, you can go back to the Teaching Flannery O'Connor webpage from which you obtained your readings, and there you will find the recording and the PowerPoint. Please, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to plunder the PowerPoint. It's there for you. Uh, if you want to take some of the material from the PowerPoint into your classes, by all means, do that. On this website, you will also find the evaluation form. It's something you can complete and submit online. It will take just a few minutes, but please do that for us. It's important to us. We pay attention to what you tell us. Once we have received your evaluation, we will send you a letter that you will be able to present to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit this seminar warrants you to. Now, we have two sets of goals for our seminar this evening. We have what you might call some instrumental goals and some intellectual goals. And here are our instrumental goals. Many of you are teaching in states that have adopted the Common Core State Standards. Well, our seminars are designed to help promote teaching to the Common Core State Standards. As you know, the Common Core helps to ensure that all students are college and career ready in literacy. And they do that by promoting close, attentive, uh, promoting close, attentive reading. And our seminars are designed to foster deep and thoughtful engagement with high quality literary and informational texts. So we'll be doing some close reading tonight, hoping that you'll be able to take those techniques into your classes. Now, how will the seminar work? Well, our professor tonight, Cindy McKeithen, will be lecturing to a presentation of slides with text excerpts that illustrate important points. Now, in some cases, we'll simply highlight the important takeaway points in the slides. But in others, we will examine the slides closely and uh, do some close reading on the text on the screen. Now, we invite you to participate. We're going to be posing discussion questions throughout the seminar. And we want you to pose questions to us. We also want you to make comments as we go along. And the way you can do that is through chat. Place your cursor in the green box that you see uh, that I've outlined there on the screen. Type your message, hit the send button to the right, and your message will appear in the larger box above. I will be following the chat all evening, and I will be bringing it into the conversation. So please, ladies and gentlemen, participate uh, in the seminar. They always are more fun when we uh, have your questions and comments to play off of. Now, I mentioned intellectual goals, and here they are. We have three for this evening's seminar. First, we hope to define the grotesque both as a literary device and as a way to emphasize a spiritual vision. 
to recognize how the grotesque relates to realism, simple humor, and Southern Gothic. Our second intellectual goal, to identify parallels and oppositions that O'Connor sets up with her characters and situations in order to develop the symbolic or allegorical level of her stories. And finally, to explore the historical and social context at play in O'Connor's South, such issues as the Old South versus the New South, religious belief, racial assumptions, and manners. We had a very good discussion of Flannery O'Connor's fiction on the forum. We had lots of comments on the forum. We got a number of questions that you posed and that we're going to try to answer this evening. For obvious reasons, O'Connor has been characterized as a Southern writer and a Catholic or Christian writer. To what extent can she be described as a woman or feminist writer? Does O'Connor critique or interrogate Christianity in her stories? What stories do teachers pair with The Good Man is Hard to Find or Revelation? If you have comments, we're not going to pose that question directly tonight, but if you have comments about how to teach O'Connor, please chat them in to us and we'll bring them into the conversation as we can. Getting back to our From the Forum questions, how does O'Connor define grace? How does she use color? What role do African Americans play in her work? How, if at all, does the nature-nurture debate figure into a good man is hard to find, and to what extent is a good man a story about faith? To lead us through those questions this evening, we're very pleased to have with us Lucinda McKeithen, uh, who is a professor emerita of English at North Carolina State University and was a fellow here at the National Humanities Center in 1984-85. Cindy has written widely on uh, Southern literature, one of her, we couldn't put all of her writings up there on the, on the slide, but we do put one, Daughters of Time, Creating Woman's Voice in Southern Story, which was published in 1992. So let me turn the program now over to Cindy. Cindy, it is all yours. Let me turn your mic on. And uh, tell us, how did this gentle-looking Southern lady come to create the misfit? Cindy, it's all yours. This is an amazing question. Um, some people would say, looking at her, her biography, that um, she herself was a misfit. So we might begin with that idea in terms of looking a little bit about where she came from as a way to think about what she managed to do. Uh, she grew up Southern and Catholic in Savannah, Georgia, and Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, to be Catholic in the South is unusual in and of itself a little bit. Um, Savannah was a little bit unusual in that it had a, a fairly strong Catholic pop population and a cathedral that O'Connor actually lived across the square from. So um, while Catholics in the South might uh, be considered unusual and some were persecuted even, um, within her own city uh, and certainly within her own large family, uh, being a Catholic was not unusual. And she would go on to say that actually for a Catholic living in the South was uh, a great advantage. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit more later. Um, uh, her father died of lupus in 1938. And one of the most interesting things to me to look at in terms of these dates a little bit is to remember that O'Connor lived only 39 years. Um, her father died when she was around 13. 13 years after that, she herself developed lupus and had to return to her mother's home uh, in Milledgeville. And 13 years after that, she herself died of lupus. Uh, these are, these are um, some of the mysterious facts of her life uh, that I think it's important to consider. She died very young. Uh, her vision might seem that of a young woman, but it's uh, the vision of someone who was facing death most of the time that she was writing. Uh, and also to remember that she published almost all of her works within that 13-year period between 1951 when she went back home uh, from the scintillating atmosphere of New York and Connecticut and Yaddo, the writers' workshops. Uh, and in that home with her mother, uh, surrounded by folks who were not, uh, were not too apart from some of the ones she portrayed in her story, um, she in that 13 years living really in isolation from 
some of the resources one might expect a writer like her to have uh, accomplished a tremendous amount. She, um, she did go to college. She knew she wanted to be a writer. Uh, she went on to Iowa in, the, in her senior year of college before she went to the Yaddo workshops and then met um, the Fitzgeralds, Robert and Sally, who later would edit and put together uh, all of her posthumous works. Uh, they were devout Catholics, so she found a very congenial family that she lived with uh, between Yaddo until she returned home to Milledgeville. Um, when you think about who influenced her, um, I did not mention the, the French Catholic philosophers um, that she read. Uh, they're not real well known, and I'm not sure they would be something you'd want to go into in much detail with students. But um, certainly uh, she had a, a good many mentors in her own life. They were very often writers who were both Catholic and Southern or at least deeply religious. Um, the Vanderbilt poets that included Robert Penn Warren um, and, and also um, she read, certainly read Faulkner and Welty and a lot of other Southern writers. She adored Joseph Conrad. I think that in terms of style, um, she ought to be linked closer to Nathaniel Hawthorne perhaps than she, than she often is. There were a lot of things about his literary technique that she, I think, learned a great deal from, as well as from Joseph Conrad. Um, she lived with lupus for all of those years, those 13 years, very often not able to move well. Uh, lupus often attacks the joints uh, and the tissues, and she was often not able to walk very well. But she managed to get around a, a very well until the, the last year of her life when she was, um, when she was stricken uh, with a, a renewed onset that, that, that simply left her unable to combat it. Uh, and she died um, in August of that year. While she was working on, I, um, I would like to mention, uh, she was working on three stories toward the end of her life. They are the last three stories in Everything That Rises Must Converge, the uh, collection of stories that was published shortly after her death. One of those three stories is Revelation. And those three last stories um, are especially remarkable as a, almost a culmination of her career. That, and, and she pretty much knew that. She knew that these stories were going to be her last uh, opportunity to really get it right um, and to say everything dramatically through her stories that she wanted to stay, say. Um, she has a short body of work. I think that's interesting to note. Uh, for 13 years, it's not short, but two novels, two short story collections. Um, the uh, collection of her stories that came out um, not long after her death uh, and the collection of her letters and the collection of her essays uh, have have been terrifically influential. And that's not something I have up here, but I think it's it's important to think a little bit about her influence. She has had such a huge influence on other writers, on filmmakers, um, on actors like Tommy Lee Jones, um, on the Coen brothers, uh, uh, Oh Brother Where Out There, for instance, on Cormac McCarthy's uh, work as well as other Southern writers like Clyde Edgerton, Lee Smith, uh, Jill McCorkle. Uh, there are very few uh, Southern writers who began writing in the 70s or 80s uh, who don't think about Flannery O'Connor and actually even talk about how important she is. So with, uh, with that in mind, um, we'll, we'll move on to think about the stories. Um, I isolated these themes as being some that we would have time to actually try to get into in some depth. So as we look at these themes, uh, the word grace automatically comes up. Uh, grace is uh, notice an action. Grace is a force. Uh, O'Connor very early hit upon um, grace as, as her major theme. Uh, she was very young when she began reading uh, Catholic writers who, 
who talked a great deal about grace in philosophical terms, but O'Connor wanted to write fiction. And, and when she really got into the concept of grace, she, it, it was the time when she pretty much figured out that what she was going to be able to do as a writer. She wanted to make it real. She wanted to make it dramatic. She did not want to preach it. She wanted to show um, how human beings uh, cannot really be said to live in the world if they have no conception of their own incompleteness and of a kind of spiritual wholeness that comes to them through the action and the force of grace uh, in a very Christian context. And we'll think about that a little bit more. For her, the technique that would get grace across to her audience most often involved violence. Um, this is in part because she believed that her audience uh, was very resistant in modern times, in her mid-20th century world, to the concept of grace. She saw her world as um, a world that had turned away from the spiritual, uh, a world that wanted sociological responses to most things, and she, uh, and she felt that she would have to shock them into uh, an understanding that there were other dimensions to life than those that either science or sociology could figure out in order for human beings to begin to understand themselves. Another thing that I think it's important for us to think about is race and racism. It's a part of her Southern heritage, but it also fit into her idea of, of looking at human beings and the way they separate um, each other from each other. A, her use of, of race and racism uh, of affirmation African American characters in her fiction um, is is uh, on a on a kind of theological level. She did not want to get into the politics of, of race in the South, even though she was living through the most turbulent times. Remember, her era is really the fifties, uh, the late forties and the fifties and the early sixties, a time of tremendous upheaval in the South, a tremendous change. In, uh, in attitudes toward race and political solutions, this was not something she cared very much to talk about, although she did understand very clearly that racism was a matter of separating, uh, and not just separating, but making difference into a matter of superiority or inferiority, and her use of African-American characters feeds that, as we'll see. Alienation was a modern theme that many people uh, and many writers of her time could accept. This is a, a period of existentialism, philosophically speaking, when uh, it is rather expected that people will will turn away, will, will rebel from the stat status quo. We're, we're about to hit the 60s. Um, when there will be a great deal of rebellion, um, and yet for for her, um, her alienated characters are often her deepest and her most spiritual characters, and that's very different from the way that alienation was used by a lot of writers uh, in the mid 20th century. So these are our themes that we'll be carrying through. Uh, Cindy, if I, wanted, I, Cindy, if I could, sure, if I could just jump sure. in here, we have we have an interesting question here. Okay. Uh, you talked about her literary mentors, and we have a question: yes. Did O'Connor have any other female literary mentors other than Eudora Welty? And that opens the door to one of our uh, form questions, uh, talking about uh, women writer mentors. Um, could she be considered in any way a feminist writer? I, I like that question, and I think it's interesting to consider. Um, she would certainly have said that she was not a feminist writer. Um, but that category wasn't bandied around so much in the 50s when she was writing. No, I mean, even, not for, even no, the category not of woman writer was not so much. No, I think it's interesting to think of the 50s as a as a time when, um, remember in 1963, we're going to get Betty Friedan uh, publishing uh, The Feminine Mystique. Uh, and a lot of that is going to be based on women's lives in the 1950s, white middle class women's lives when women are, um, you know, happy in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They and and. 
one of the interesting things to me about O'Connor, and I'm glad to get to this question while we're thinking about her biography, is she was surrounded um, a good deal of her life uh, by strong women figures who were having to um, enter the business world and to manage on their own, uh, you know, perhaps most dramatically her own mother, um, who took over uh, the family farm out from Milledgeville, uh, who lived without her, her husband for many, many years and lived a long time after O'Connor did. But her mother's influence, I think, is an interesting thing to consider from the feminist standpoint. And also, when you get into her stories, you're going to see all these women they are women without men. Very often, they are business women. Um, so that's a feminist angle that that I think we can associate with O'Connor. She did not push for women's rights. Uh, she, interestingly, we don't know much about her own romantic life. There's very little of romance or a sense of the romantic in her fiction. There's also not a sense that women are in any way uh, inferior to men, though, as well. Um, her, it is often her women characters who have to struggle most deeply with uh, their own smug self-satisfaction. It is often women characters who, who are, are being hit uh, with the book of grace. Um, and, and so from that angle, I think it's uh, a very useful idea to consider her attitudes toward women. Uh, a little bit differently than most feminists did, but still to think about strong women characters. Yeah, well, your, your, your uh, comment about being hit by the Book of Grace reminds me of the story Good Country People, and there you've got a woman who, if there's any kind of feminist character in O'Connor, it's that the, the intellectual with the artificial leg, the woman in, in Good Country People. And, of course, she literally gets hit or fooled by a Bible salesman. Yeah. You know I mean, she's yes, yes. so... And, yeah, yeah, Joy Joy Holga is sure, that's right, that's right. one of um, O'Connor's favorite intellectuals. Uh, she matches up very well with a, a character, um, a male character in *The Enduring Chill*. Both of uh -huh. them are very smug in their non-belief, uh, and and they the sexual side of. Um, male or female is not something she delved into, although I think it, uh, a good story to look at her own femininity and feminine issues is probably her most autobiographical story, uh, The Temple of the Holy Ghost, where, where right. the character is a, a pre-teenage girl really beginning to face some of those issues of what it means to be a woman sexually as well as spiritually, and, and that's, a, that's a, a, a good way to look at, at her use of women characters. Yeah, yeah, a good country people has some, some sexual uh, well, yeah. overtones to it, too. <laughs> oh, now that you mentioned uh, her own autobiography, we have a question here. Did she, her stories have so much violence in them. Do we know if she ever experienced violence directly in her life? Um, I don't believe so. I think that, I, I don't, I think her sense of what violence was, and she wrote a good bit about this, was as a tool. Um, she had a fairly idyllic growing up with a large family and with a father whom she was very, very close to before he died. But I do think if we think about her dealings with lupus, um, that's a kind of violence. Uh, lupus brought her to the extreme of having to live almost as though somebody was going to shoot her every day of her life. Mm -hmm. And and that really was her philosophy of violence. Uh, but in her own life, I think her illness was uh, a kind of violence that she had to face from the time that, that you know, she was barely uh, in her 30s. Uh, right. And she also saw her father having to face the brutality of that disease and watching his own violent death just from this physical disease. And, of course, she lived on a farm all those years that she was writing. And she saw, I think, a lot of um, animal brutality that she didn't disassociate so much from the way she thought humans could treat each other as well. Okay. All right. Well, let's move ahead. We've got uh, got about an hour or so. We've got a lot of territory to cover. Yes, we do. And um, this, as we look um, 
look a little bit at mystery and manners. Uh, one question I'd like to pose to the teachers a little bit is she, uh, her essays in mystery and manners do a lot to explain her stories. Um, she talks about some of the stories specifically, including a good man is hard to find. Um, and yet, how does a teacher, how much does a teacher want to use a writer's own intentions about what they are doing to explain and to read their works? Do we want to go ahead and let the work live on its own? Or is it useful to bring in things that um, the writer says, either about the themes that are involved in the work or about her own techniques? Um, in O'Connor, whose works can be very uh, perplexing without some understanding of the Christian beliefs uh, that she had and also her critique of, of the modern uh, era that she lived in as a godless, soulless, and pretty smug and self-satisfied uh, world, uh, you know, having some of that critique um, that that especially comes from the essays in Mystery and Manners is can be very useful and 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 many of her comments enrich the stories as well. Um, I think it'd be hard to teach her w without talking about her own statements about her Christian perspective. But um, does that uh, does that make her too preachy? Uh, is she, you know, is she kind of throwing the Bible book at us and expecting us to swallow whole a very orthodox Christian uh, doctrine that she herself uh, was absolutely determined uh, to to hold to in her own life? But one of the things that I think is important to consider is, especially in terms of her religious views, is that she didn't believe you had to write uh, about Christians, and um, uh, certainly a good many of her characters do not want to be Christian. They would not call themselves Christians. We don't get nuns and priests in here either. We're not writing about Catholics or about Christians trying to deal with the world and, and identifying themselves in that way. But she did believe that uh, a religious faith could shape an artistic vision. She was she wanted to be an artist. She did not want to be a preacher. But she also felt that her religious faith was her identity and that it would have to be uh, incorporated in the artistic vision that she was going to present to her, her readers. Uh, we also have to consider uh, that Mystery Manners gives us a lot of her views about being a Southerner. Um, and uh, one of the things that she felt strongly about was that Southerners uh, were religious people. She said they're very much afraid that they're formed in the image and likeness of God. Um, and they, they are Christ haunted. They might want to be escaping Christ, but in the South, it's harder to do. She talked about the South being um, the Bible Belt. Um, let's, let's get on to uh, some of her own definitions. And here I'd like to, to um, make, a, make a plug for let's not let these terms uh, 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 control how we think of the stories of the South. We hear the word Southern Gothic all the time, uh, and it's used to describe O'Connor. We also hear the word Southern Grotesque used interchangeably with Southern Gothic. For O'Connor, they were very different, and I think they, uh, O'Connor's sense of the Southern grotesque, she wrote an essay about it, was a very religious term. Um, and it was a term that she used to describe how the comic and the violent can be used in a, in a way that is so integrated that when you are laughing, you want to cry, and when you are crying, you want to laugh. Um, and she felt that, that that kind of displacement and discomfort over laughter um, within violence and violence within a comic thing happened. You think of somebody slipping on a banana peel. Well, is that funny? Or, or if you see someone uh, breaking their leg or being 
uh, paralyzed forever? Uh, is, it, is it a horrific violence? Well, grotesquery, that's the Southern grotesque to her, combined the comic and the violent in a way that for her helped shock her readers, helped move them to a different level of, of discourse and thinking about what was happening in stories. And so the grotesque was a great weapon for her, but it, it fit into her religious vision of the way the spiritual and the material were so deeply integrated that they had to be considered together. And her audiences, unless they had this kind of distortion to mystify them and to actually repulse them a little bit, but also make them laugh, she didn't think they'd get it. Southern Gothic is very different. Uh, it does not have a religious element. It, it is the use of terror and horror and perversity and perversion. Uh, some of Faulkner's stories might fit into that. But certainly O'Connor was not Southern Gothic and in any way that I think we would want to want to use. So so uh, that's my plug for getting those terms separate. You're going to see them in all the criticism being talked about almost interchangeably. But uh, they, are, they are two very different things, especially as O'Connor saw them in her fiction. Um, Cindy, if I, if I could just jump in here for a moment. Sure, um, sure. We have on your question about whether or not teachers bring in criticism to their classes, yeah. we've pretty much, I've been following the chat, and it's pretty much a split decision. It's a split decision. Some <laughs> folks, particularly regarding O'Connor, say you really need her criticism to understand the stories. Other teachers are saying, no, you, you let the story stand alone and you don't need the criticism. So I'm not going to read all those comments, but I just wanted to let everyone know it's a split decision. And going back to her religion, you know, she, she was a Catholic, but she, um, I think, uh, she found in Catholic theology those elements that uh, uh, overlap with evangelical Protestant theology. And I think that's where she centered her stories. Because if you didn't know that she was Catholic, just reading those stories, I think you'd think she was, if you gave any, you know, if you paid attention to her religion at all, you'd think, well, she's of, of an evangelical fundamentalist persuasion. And I think she, she centered her stories on that, that, that theological overlap between Catholic theology and evangelical Protestant theology. Would that be fair to say? Well, I think it almost. Uh, I think what she said in her own essay about being a Catholic no novelist is that the Catholic in the South, especially the Catholic fiction writer, got a huge boost um, from the, the Bible Belt evangelical fundamentalist uh, drama that played itself out so much in, um, in the South because she felt that the evangelicals, the fundamentalists, took their religion literally and seriously. Uh, and I think she believed that it was very possible for Catholics to become way too abstract, uh, way too kind of perhaps um, locked into the grand cathedrals where the spiritual was something above and transcendent, but did not get down and dirty in the mud, in the muck. Um, she felt that Catholic theology uh, at its core had that incarnational sense. I, I think to use the word incarnation is, is appropriate here. A very Catholic doctrine, but the fundamentalists and the evangelicals um, did not see that, uh, that incarnation as looking upward so much as seeing um, within every moment uh, uh, the need to incorporate their religion in hallelujahs, in, in falling down into the dirt, in, in proselytizing uh, with road signs on the road. She liked the way the fundamentalists uh, brought home the message in a very literal way that she often felt like Catholics uh, kind of drained the meat out of, out mm -hmm. of the faith. Mm -hmm. So you might say she filtered her Catholic theology through the barnyard down the yeah. dirt. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think she'd be comfortable with that. I mean, okay. And, and I All right. Well, let, let's move ahead. Did. Yeah. I, I, didn't, okay. I didn't mean to derail us back to Catholicism. Let's move ahead. <laughs> Okay, and uh, so let's let's just, let's get into it. Uh, let's see how this works itself out Pro in her probably most famous story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, one of her earliest stories. And one of the things I hope we can see in taking one of her earliest and most successful but, and also most controversial stories and one of her last stories, one of what was called her deathbed trilogy, the last three stories, to see if we can get a sense of how she might have changed um, 
in, in any respect in the way she wanted to deal with some of her themes in her own fiction. Um, first, we might look at this very early passage, um, and, and, and I would just note all the way through here, this is a very early passage, and it is terrifically descriptive. We are being embedded. Uh, O'Connor believed that if her audience couldn't believe her, her natural world was real and credible, they would never uh, take that journey with her to a more interior, spiritual, transcendent level. So realism was extremely important to her. And uh, as you see the, the clothing described, she got very angry at, critic, at, at professors and critics alike who wanted to build symbolism into a lot of her physical details. Um, the blue straw sailor hat, she said, was just a blue straw sailor hat. What's important, of course, is to see that the, lay, the grandmother's dressing in this way so that if she were found uh, dead on the highway, people would know she was a, a lady, is, of course, a terrific symbolic foreshadowing. Um, the beautiful colors that she uses, are they symbolic? Blue, red, purple, silver, green? Uh, well, they could be, uh, but they don't have to be. The grandmother is uh, it being shown here as a terrifically colorful person who also has almost an artist's way of speaking. She's pointing all these wonderful things out. Uh, she has a sense of the world. Um, the important thing is, of course, that for all the beautiful kaleidoscopic colors we have, the last statement is the one that brings all the symbolism of the color simply as color together in the term, the meanest of them sparkled. So um, this very early um, passage is is really important, uh, especially as we'll come to the word mean at the end of the story. Um, well, if, I, if I could just interrupt sure. again, I'm sorry. That answers, no, one of our, that answers one of our form questions about color. So you're saying that mm -hmm. um, in O'Connor, color is just color, but you have to watch for the, the way she contextualizes color. Color is the meanest of them. Right, oh. right. I think right. I think in some of her colors, especially if there is a kind of liturgical sense to them, oh. uh, she's kind of, and she can be like Hawthorne in this uh, with his use of black and white, mm -hmm. but her with the use of green, um, the use of white, the use of red when it's a liturgical sense. These, uh, I, I think she's using her colors. Uh, if there is symbolism, it's going to probably be uh, a religious symbolism related to uh, the use of colors in the church. Right. And if we could go back to that, that last quote, I think we, with that last passage, I think we have a little class distinction there, too. She talks about the mother uh, wearing slacks, but she doesn't say she just had on slacks. She emphasizes it with still. The mother still had on slacks yeah. and still had her head tied up in a green kerchief, whereas she's well-dressed. So we're getting a, you know, we're getting a, um, a from from the mother's point of view, we're getting a, a superiority, inferiority thing going on here. Would that be fair to say? Sure, sure. And I think we're also getting an old South, new South. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, and the sense of, of manners that um, and rituals. The the grandmother is going to be a ritualist. The 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 poor daughter who has a has enough to make us not wonder at all that she's still in slacks. Uh, the daughter-in-law is part of that modern world where we've lost all of those things. And that is, but the class distinction, as we're certainly going to see even more in Revelation, is um, is a huge way for O'Connor to be almost allegorical. Um, people separate themselves by class as they do so. They are they are separating themselves from God in an allegorical way. Mm -hmm. uh, and the class distinctions of the South, like the racial prejudice, are are symbolic in terms for her of their uh, showing us how people try to claim superiority by cutting themselves off from others. Right. We have a very interesting comment here. What about calling the children's mother? Uh, as though she is not a person, but a vehicle through which the grandmother can have grandchildren. So, yeah, the children's mother is, is a cipher in the story. Oh, uh, well, yes, she is. And the interesting thing is Bailey almost is as yeah. well. Um, yeah. We are really, I don't think, able to say very much about anybody except the grandmother and the misfit as uh, as made real and intensely um, 
grabbing us with the reality of their thinking and their behaviors. The, the mother is um, uh, a cipher, uh, you know, uh, when they're all led off to the woods to be shot, I think in some ways O'Connor is trying to insulate us from, from caring too much. Uh, but, but, uh, but certainly I think that's very true. She's just a vehicle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, and, shall we move on then? Sure. sure. Let's, uh, let's look at the next passage just a tiny bit. I'd, um, I, want, I pointed out in the question that there are three different uh, uses of the uh, of a word for African Americans: Piccaninny, Negro, and nigger. Uh, and and in this section, it's um, it's it's important to see the grandmother's own um, sense of what race is. She, uh, by the way, we got a typo there. Uh, that yeah, little I see that. Sorry. <laughs> well, that's okay. That was it from the story itself that I copied it from. But, um, you, and here we might even talk about point of view, um, because here is where O'Connor comes in uh, and tells us that the grandmother is pointing at a Negro child. This is not the grandmother's language, and is it? It is not the grandmother's. Um, understanding of the need to give dignity to those of another race. And of course, the irony is that she's telling her own grandchildren that they need to respect others. That's a, it's a, it's just a little vignette, but the, it's a picture of racism that I think is very useful for us to have in terms simply of the language and the way um, blacks are called uh, by others. So this passage can help us show that the grandmother, of course, is a is a is a first class, world class hypocrite herself. So uh, that will help us. Now we get into the red Sammy section. Now my students have a lot of trouble with this section. Why in the world is it there? Why do we have to stop at red Sammy's? Uh, well, Red Sammy in, embeds us in the real again, and of course, Red Sammy brings in that word "good" in lots of different contexts. So, we've we've got uh, the word "good," and also we hear the name of the misfit brought up, and I think that that will serve to help us. She is drawing us out of the of the incredibly real, credible world that she has gotten us into in this automobile in the 1950s South. And the minute we leave Red Sammy's and take that turn down a dirt road where the grandmother thinks she's going to find this classy plantation that will take her back to her old South memories. When we get out of Red Sammy's, we're not going to be very much longer in a realistic world. We're going to be in a world that has twisted itself into the grotesque in order to horrify us. Uh, we've had all this comedy uh, of the of the bratty children and Red Sammy, uh, and and the mother and the the his wife bringing the misfit in and saying he's everywhere. Well, he is indeed everywhere, and of course, and we know they're going to meet up with the misfit, uh, and we're just padded here, and we're also introduced to what in the world does it mean to be a good man. Um, and to the and to the very words, a good man is hard to find, which in relationship to Red Sammy is pure comedy. This is pure comedy. This isn't grotesque yet. This is purely comic for, for Red Sammy, who himself is is such a kind of a mean slob. He treats his wife so badly, a whining, complaining fellow. Uh, but he's a good man, and for the grandmother to call him that sets up the repetition with variation that is extremely important technique for her. She will repeat scenes, but she will have moved us to an entirely different level of spiritual awareness uh, when she repeats those same words uh, in, a, in the next context that we're going to see. So it's a, it's a very useful section, the Red Sammy section. If I, if I could just interrupt you for a moment, um, in connection with our, our common core standards and close reading, perhaps a good assignment might be to have students trace her use of the word good, that single word throughout the story that would really focus them and uh, cause them to turn their microscopes down to the fine attachment to see uh, just how she uses language. Yeah, and I think following a word through a poem or a story or a novel or even a, uh, a speech um, to see, again, that sense of repetition with variation 
Okay, how does it change? Not just that it's repeated, because that is like giving you an exclamation point. When a writer repeats a word, uh, that's pay attention, but also to note the change with the repetition uh, that helps move things forward and, and isolate meanings when that repetition occurs. Okay, um, we get, of course, into this last section where um, the grandmother and the family have had their wreck and we're we're like I say, we're in we're in new territory. O'Connor counted on this, and my question uh, here is: as we look very closely at um, at at this section in the last section, this is terrifically violent. Uh, a whole family is about to get slaughtered, um, <laughs> uh, murdered by this man. Um, can we get beyond the violence to the point where we can actually pay attention to what she's doing here closely enough to really understand how O'Connor wanted this to be about the action of grace in the grandmother's soul more than simply the fear and the horror and the terror um, that she is faced with as she knows her family is killed and that she is soon going to be killed. Uh, again, we've got the repetition of being a good man. You're not common. Notice how she tries to fall back on manners and rituals. Um, that that's calling him a good man is somehow going to recall him to the reality she wants to put him in, someone who wouldn't treat a lady badly. Um, notice here, we're going to see another uh, little uh, detail that will be repeated, don't see no sun, but don't see no cloud, neither, says um, says the misfit. Uh, now you have to know the book of Revelation uh, to get, to get one of the one of the inferences that's being used here, because of course in the in the vision of heaven uh, that we received from John in the book of Revelation at the end of the Bible is uh, a, a new kingdom in which there is no sun. Um, and there is no moon, and there there is no cloud anymore because it is a, a new a new world. Uh, let's uh, let's go on to uh, the 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 um, uh, the continuation of the of of the um, the dialogue. Uh, the word Jesus begins to be repeated again and again. The grandmother, but notice the ambiguity, the mystery. Is she, is she cursing or is she praying? We assume she's praying, but it sounds like she might be cursing. So again, the grandmother herself is beginning to be stripped of all the inessentials. Uh, and her own certainty is one of the things that has to be burnt off of her. She has to lose her sense that she knows the way the world has to be. Um, and she's not going to do that uh, until she is faced with the most extreme situation that a human being can face, and that is, of course, their own death. Meanwhile, the misfit um, shows himself to be a kind, one of one of many of her kind of um, uh, prophets gone wrong. Uh, someone who is a seeker after truth, but someone who has become so twisted and disturbed. Uh, that that he all he can do is feel the the burr under the saddle. He cannot rest. He is furious that he doesn't know whether Christ really came to save him, and because he doesn't, he's his anger and his fury, um, and also his his own uncertainty, and also his understanding of his own need for grace, which by the way, of course, is something the grandmother doesn't have, is going to make him into this violent figure who is also a prophet, and also, of course, I'm very ironically, going to be an agent of grace in the grandmother. Um, the 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 emphasis um, in in throughout these this final passage of um, at notice uh, in the highlighted passage no pleasure but meanness and remember back to that description the meanest uh, of them sparkled what does it mean to be mean <laughs> well consider the lilies of the field they're mean right they're small they're insignificant. Uh, but meanness also means uh, cruelty. Uh, and so if a word can have these 
this completely dualistic dichotomy of meaning. Uh, so can human beings be made of pure evil with the potential for uh, redeemed good. Uh, so the language fits the message here as well. Um, the final movement of the story, of course, is the gesture that the grandmother makes finally when, when faced with uh, nothing but her own soul in the drama of what is true good and evil, is able to reach out and make the good gesture that is so important to O'Connor as a, as a vehicle in, in most of her stories. Um, and, and to read this passage closely, um, she sees the man's face twisted close as if he were going to cry. You're one of my babies. You're one of my own children. Uh, and of course, he springs back as though a snake has bitten her and then uh, takes off his glasses. Uh, that's going to be significant because uh, as we continue uh, the passage, um, we're going to find that taking off his glasses, his eyes are red rimmed and pale and defenseless looking. If we're thinking about O'Connor's stories being about vision, we think about the grandmother's vision that he is one of her own children. But is the misfit himself about to get a burr under his saddle that will not allow him to continue the way he has been? Has he lost his defenses too? Is he about to have to be called to account in a way that will might give him a chance to make a similar gesture uh, of change and understanding of his own sin and his own possibility for redemption? So that's a good man. It's hard to find. And I'm We've got some questions. Yes, we have we have a number of uh, good questions and comments here. One of the questions, one of the comments too, is about um, the grandmother's seeing. And we yes. we described as she goes through the countryside, she re describes everything. And one of our participants noted that uh, her students note that she sees everything and describes everything. Might it would it be fair to say that she? She sees things, but she doesn't understand them. Her, her vision is merely superficial. When she comes to the uh, misfit, one of our participants writes, again, she sees the man, the misfit, but she can't seem to sense or feel his evil, not initially, not initially. And then another participant writes, oh, I think she can, and it shakes her worldview down to its foundational. Is she pray, praying or cursing? Uh, could you comment some more about the, the grandmother's seeing? What, what's the significance of that? Okay, I really, I really like the idea of t looking at that early passage when to entertain the children. She, she notes uh, the colors of everything, but, but um, certainly O'Connor is all about sight versus insight, and uh, the the idea that she does indeed see all the beautiful colors of the world uh, without being able. Uh, to use them to to connect herself to the world uh, or even to her own family. I think that I think that'd be a great way to think about her seeing in that early passage, uh, because of course she missees or she is completely blind uh, when she tries to impose her own lack of sight, uh, i.e., calling Red Sammy a good man. Um, and, and we're going to see that blindness exposed even more as she, as she again, tries to take that limited use of the word good as she sees these two men who, um, who uh, at, at the deepest level, could be good, but not in the sense that she, in her blindness, is trying to see them. Mm -hmm. well, she's using the word good in both, uh, both situations, it seems to me, just to make a social connection with somebody. She doesn't really mean it, of course, with Sammy, but she's just trying to you know, sort of condescend and make a connection with the guy. Yes, I think As a compliment, that's true. an empty compliment. Yes, it is an empty compliment. I think it's also, though, uh, an attempt for her to impose her superiority on them. Right. Ironically enough, when she calls them good, she has become their judge from a, a standpoint of seeing herself above them, and that's and that's an important use of it as right. well. She gets to call who's good and who isn't, and and they can only be uh, flattered by oh. that that appellation. <laughs> yeah. Good good point. Good point. <laughs> Um, we have another question here. This one, this one's going to be a tough one here. Is the misfit's poor grammar important to consider um, in his last prophetic statement? Would have been. 
I'm always struck by that, participant rights. Would, would have been. Any, what about the grammar there, Cindy? Anything uh, significant going on there in oh, your mind? Well, of course, he's, uh, I, I think she um, very intentionally has the misfit um, speak in, a, in, a, in the kind of working class or mm -hmm. uh, underclass, uh, almost peasant, <laughs> that's the way grandmother would see it, dialect. Um, she would have been a good woman. Um, I, I like to call attention to this being conditional. Uh, in, in, a, in a sense, uh, his grammar there is almost better than usual. <laughs> she, she would have been a good one. I mean, he's not saying would have, but um, but he's got. Uh, if it had been somebody um, there to shoot her every minute of her life, uh, it's it's bad grammar, but it's but it's also a stab at a, at a very complex kind of yeah. use of conditional tense, which I think is useful to useful to see, especially in relationship with his um, his use of the word so. You know, the, the way that's repeated, so are they, so are in with the others, so um, you know, mm -hmm. instead of throw them. Um, and then you have this statement that is is not really in that kind of Southern dialect uh, and that in some ways lifts, again, she is making her reader transcend uh, the real situation in, in order to contemplate this concept of being shot every minute of your life. Uh, and only being truly good when you are facing the extreme situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that boils you down to your essence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have, um, uh, we're getting real symbolic here. Are the okay. three shots to the chest suggestive of the Trinity? <sighs> I've never thought of that one. I, I never have either, but you know, I'm, I, I, I um, and, I'm not going to say it wasn't because I think it's possible. I, 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 I she got very mad at people who uh, would do things like say, "Well, the grandmother's a witch because she has a cat." Okay. Oh. Uh, she she actually some professor wrote her a letter about that, and that made it. She said, "You are straining the suit way too thin." <laughs> but mm -hmm. but when there is a possibility of of using. Um, symbolism that her audience might have recognized as being, again, liturgical or as as promoting the mystery. The mystery of the Trinity is, again, incarnational. Uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost incorporates in God a sense of the incarnate Son and the, and the Holy Spirit. So, so the three shots, uh, if, you, if you see the, the word three, then getting the three shots, the shot of the incarnational God that O'Connor wants uh, to be recognized, why not? I like that idea myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got another uh, comment here. Um, the fact that the misfit takes off his glass, uh, has glasses and then removes them makes him a blind prophet. But mm -hmm. following upon that, let me find the question. Ah, person asks, what does the misfit mean when he states that Jesus threw everything off balance? Okay. Well, I, <laughs> I'd love to see someone else tackle that one, but but um, but I'll 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 say what. Uh, he, well, we're going to hear Ruby Turpin say in the next story, put the bottom rail on top. You've still got a top and a bottom. Uh, and and that's what I think the misfit means by throwing off balance. Jesus Christ did not operate the way the misfit logic, if, if anybody's following logic, Christ's punishment, the punishment Christ allowed himself to take for our sins was hugely out of line, the misfit is saying, with anything he did uh, related to that punishment. So the lack of balance is between um, Jesus as the good man and what he had to suffer. Um, uh, the misfit understands suffering, but he is infuriated by the injustice, of both of his own suffering, and by the idea that it's not necessarily a bad thing to uh, suffer, you see, <laughs> that, right. that we are meant to suffer. We are meant to be exposed and in that way redeemed, and that's what Christ's own suffering was all about. Mm -hmm. Another participant writes, well, he raised the dead, and that act threw everything off balance. Oh, yes. Yeah, that too. Yeah, but he that raised too. the dead. He raised yeah. 
dead by not dying to himself. Yeah. Right. And then finally, we, we've got to move on, but there's one final comment here about a good man. Um, com participant writes about the grandmother, <clears throat> I thought at first she was superficial more than naive, that she is simply innocent of evil. Until the end, and even then, she remained strong in seeing innocence in the misfit as good. Does she really see the goodness in the misfit, or is this just another replay of the empty compliment that um, she gave to Red Sammy? In this case, she's trying to curry favor to save her life. Um, not at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, th okay. I think I think you have to to see the accretion of um, her beginning. That she has been stripped at this point. Um, maybe he didn't raise the dead, she says. Remember, she has she has been stripped down to not knowing what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong anymore. And when she saw the man's face twisted close to her own as if he were going to cry, she murmured. Now, we haven't seen her murmur either. Why, you're one of my own babies. And I think the way that's worded, why? You're one of my own babies. You see the surprise? Right, she right. She herself is surprised here. She is not calculating. I think I think we could say that. She's she's surprised and she actually reaches out to touch him. Right. Um and that and that I think can can show us that she has gotten to a different level. This is not the same old malarkey design to, to get her out of a fix or into a, a superior place. Okay, well, you didn't mention James Joyce as one of her mentors, but here we have, I think, an epiphany, right? Uh -huh. Yes, definitely. And, uh, and of course, James Joyce uh, was certainly a writer that, that um, did many of the same kinds of things she did in terms of, of uh, looking at faith. Uh, with a little bit more critical eye on his case, but still yeah. a sense of the frustration and and violence that could be attached to dogma uh, when it's when one is trying to work. How is it going to really play out in my own actual life? Yeah. Right, right. Well, he was from Southern Ireland too, you know. Yeah, so, well, there you go. well <laughs> okay. Why don't we move ahead? And I, let me give my, our participants a warning. Uh, we've got about 30 minutes, but we're probably going to go a little over tonight. So stay with us. So, Cindy, shall we go on to Revelation? Yes. Let Let's get to Revelation again, one of these last stories. Um, and oh, two overall uh, questions that I hope we can consider. Uh, of course, the title is, is awfully important to start with. Um, uh, and what uh, certainly I think we would want students to, to say, what does, what does Revelation mean in either a, in both a spiritual and a non-spiritual uh, uh, context? And of course, the the opening setting of the story takes place in a doctor's office. The closing setting takes place at, at a pig parlor. Um, what's the connection? Uh, uh, and so with those beginning questions, we can get into the story. Okay, before uh, we do, very, very quickly, just so I don't forget, what were the other two stories in her final trilogy? Okay, the other two stories are a story called Parker's Back, which is a fantastic story. I love it. I had a hard time with it for a long time, but this is a, a guy who gets a tattoo of Christ, um, and not a nice Christ, not a happy child-loving Christ, but a suffering Byzantine image of Christ tattooed on his back. And his name is Parker, and Park is going to carry, he wants a tattoo of Christ placed on his back. And, and she goes through the whole history of imagery of Christ, and she has this guy sit in a tattoo parlor and look at a book of images of Christ and pick the one he wants on his back. Parker's back is the one, and the very okay. last story is a story called Judgment Day. Judgment Day, okay. And those both appear in Everything That Rises Must Converge. That's right. They're the last three they're the last three stories, and, and they are all significant in the way that Revelation is because in, in all of them, the character gets the vision of what grace is and what his own sinfulness is and what his own redemptive possibilities are and gets to live <laughs> long enough to have to deal with the consequences of the vision. In a lot of her early stories, we get someone like the grandmother 
who uh, is, is shot at the moment she has that vision of grace. And we can see her as redeemed, but we get no clue as to what she might have done with that had she lived. Uh, in these last three stories and a few others, but especially in these last three, you get to see the character um, really assess what has happened to him or her in a way that makes them confront themselves in a whole new light. And that's what's really different about these last three stories. And as I say, a, a couple of others, but really the last three show O'Connor being not just interested in the moment of the action of grace, that might kill you, but at least you've been redeemed, she's finally, I think, getting to a maturity where she wants her characters to have to make something of their new understanding. Mm -hmm. And and in these stories, that happens. Yeah. She seemed to be trying to break out at that point of the kind of, you know, pride, uh, pr proudful character, proud character, uh, confronting a grotesque and then uh, being brought to grace. It was kind, oh, of a, right. kind of a pattern. And here at the end, she's trying to break through that. Okay. Shall we move ahead then? Sure, sure, and let's 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 point out um, that in this story, another thing she does, which I love, is really use Southern dialect in a way that can show students how dialect, literary dialect, can work. Because of course, dialect becomes a class marker in this story in a way that is terrifically useful uh, a, as a way to point out people who, in their proper speech, are also seeing themselves as much better than everyone else. So when you've got the poor white trash woman, and of course that's what Ruby calls her, she, you know, she she speaks that low class dialect, uh, and of course the question becomes: do, Does standard dialect give people an advantage uh, that allows them to be seen by others as superior and allows them to see themselves as superior? Here's the stylish lady. Of course, Ruby Turpin has given her that nice label, and one of the things that makes her stylish is that, of course, she is uh, speaks the King's English very beautifully and is also, of course, a cipher. Everything that comes out of this mother's mouth is, a, is just one of the most tritest, you know, statements. She is, she is never going to commit herself, and, of course, the irony is she's the mother of this of this freakish daughter, and I use the word freak advisedly because uh, O'Connor felt freaks were terrifically instructive, <laughs> and the way she describes her in this highlighted passage, um, the, and and the way Mrs. Turpin responds to have uh, that she she's a horrible, pitiful, um, sad-looking creature, uh, and and so things are being set up here. Um, in in a way that it, in terms of the dialect, the the sense of who's in and who's out is uh, is is extremely funny, uh, but also extremely useful in showing the way the bottom rail is going to be put on top at the end of this story. Um, in the next section that we have here, um, that that we have again, we have Ruby Turpin uh, making difference into hierarchy. Uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, okay, so she's got people all in their, their nice categories. And placing people, of course, is, is part of a, a southern ritual that belongs to uh, a region in, in which class and race become identifiers uh, that do put people, pigeonhole people in and entrap them in ways that can make them powerless or powerful. And here's Mrs. Uh, Turpin, the incredibly self-righteous. Again, pure comedy. This is comedy. This is this is not the grotesque yet. We're just having a great deal of fun seeing this this woman uh, epitomize self-satisfaction and smugness. Um, but there is at the end of this little section something some of your students might note that is thrown in here in a way that is completely mystifying. Notice we have a reference to the Holocaust. Uh, she, she has this nice hierarchy going for her. And then by the end of the, you know, she says, while she's lying there doing this when she can't sleep, all of a sudden everybody's crammed together in a boxcar being ridden off to be put in a gas oven. Wow, where does that come from? <laughs> and what do we do with that? When she's just finished putting everybody in their place, she's going to put them all in a boxcar headed for a gas oven. 
well, um, this is a this is again a wonderful passage. We won't look at it closely, but it's a it's a um, it's a scene that shows the the girl's mother, the white trash woman, um, and Mrs. Turpin uh, showing uh, showing themselves in a in a way that fits this doctor's office. And here, one thing I don't want the white trash woman said. And of course, she's setting up the work hog from hell. She is not going to call a pig anything but a pig. They're nasty, stinking things. And of course, Ruby can't bear that. They belong to her. So their feet never touch the ground, not her pigs. Uh, so again, we're getting that last section set up here in the doctor's office where everybody is diseased, sick, ill, uh, incomplete in some way or another. And we're re getting the reference to the pigs. Are they nasty, stinking things or are they washed clean where their feet never have to touch the ground. And of course, we know Ruby's been looking at people's shoes too here in the doctor's office. So all of this, notice the way it's integrated. The imagery is just so beautifully done. And again, we've got an early scene that is balanced and repeats and is repeated in a later scene, but with all the differences in the world. In other words, the doctor's office is a kind of pig parlor. Uh, and and so when we get to the pig parlor, we, we can make that connection between the humans and the pigs and the warthog. Uh, so uh, on we go as quickly as we can so we can have some good time for discussion. Um, again, uh, that's the thank you, Jesus, thank you. Uh, and here comes the book, uh, the wonderful comic uh, and of course, her name is Mary Grace. Uh, we know what to do with that. <laughs> when Mary Grace Bowles throws that book, we we know uh, why, uh, and we know that of course Ruby deserves it. Uh, that's uh, and of course Ruby's name we could think about too. Ruby the Jewel and Turpin, Turpentine, Turpitude, um, the good and the bad all rolled into one that she doesn't see yet. So her head clears. Notice her head clears and her power of motion returned. Now, this is one of these moments where already Ruby knows that she was meant to get this message and that she needed to understand it. Here she is very different from what we're able to see with a grandmother or Holga in Good Country People or a host of O'Connor's other characters who um, get the vision and then, then they're gone. Um, uh, like Julian even in Everything That Rises Must Converge. We don't go on, but here Ruby has this sense that some, for some reason she deserved it. And she says, what you got to say to me, you see. As she asks for the words and she gets them, go back to hell where you came from, you old ward hog. Uh, and, and of course, we've had the hogs introduced to them as nasty, stinking things. Um, then we have this wonderful passage uh, that we don't have to go into, but here, here is Ruby again, not tossing off that remark and saying, well, this was a, a freakish girl who had no sense in her. She takes that message seriously, you see. I'm not a warthog from hell, she says. A respectable, hard-working, church-going woman. Uh, at, but then, of course, notice in that last scene where she goes down to the pig parlor. Uh, and in a wonderful letter, O'Connor once said, uh, I love Ruby. It takes a mighty good woman to holler at the Lord across a pig pen. <laughs> So, uh, and that's what she's doing, asking God, furious, angry. Notice the anger in her. It's kind of that same anger the misfit had to understand that the, the, that the world is not balanced the way we want it balanced uh, and, that, and that she's got to account for it. Uh, why me? No trash. No, here black or white that I haven't given to. Okay, why me? Well, and of course, we get that wonderful vision. But first we get uh, her telling the God, and a wonderful humor, put that bottom rail on top. And of course, that's exactly what's going to happen when she finally gets the vision with the red glow of the sunset 
and and the pigs here's the vision it highlighted at the very end of the story uh, and again we've moved into pure allegory here and we've moved into the to the book of revelation in the bible with this the souls marching toward heaven and oh finally there are she and claude <laughs> behind the others but with great dignity they're only they're the only ones singing on key, but their faces are completely shocked and altered. Um, the writing here is just so beautiful, from the battalion of freaks uh, to she and Claude bringing up the rear. <laughs> but at least she's in the band, but just barely. Amen. So uh, we have in in this story. Um, the uh, uh, the the question of of that I think might be interesting to to ask is is to let students answer Ruby you know how how is he how is he going to respond <laughs> to all those questions she's putting to him um, and and of course again as with the grandmother how has she changed and also why has she changed in this story. Okay. We've had, we've had a number of questions about the the girl in the uh, waiting room. Mm -hmm. uh, to the effect, a number of comments to the effect that the girl was uh, sensitive and sensed Ruby's uh, pride and arrogance, and that's what um, provoked her her outrage and her fit. We want to comment on that character. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I, of course. Also, notice the book she's reading: Human Behavior. The human development, <laughs> so, actually. Yeah. Oh, human development. That's right. Human development, which of course is also very ironic because it it could mean she's um, she's one of those intellectuals like Holga. I mean, she has a lot of similarities to to Holga in a way, but I think it's very true. Um, she she sees right through Ruby. Uh, uh, almost immediately, and I think that is what what makes her so angry. She cannot bear this woman who s sees herself as so beautiful and so wonderful, especially in comparison to herself, of course uh, her her face scarred so badly. Um, I think her fury is at the hypocrisy, the smugness uh, the 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 bigotry uh, and the blindness. Uh, I think that's what Mary Grace is all about. And we have a um, comment here. My students have been intrigued by the fact that she thinks she is so good by giving her workers cold water, but it's as if she's putting out water for animals. I think that's that's a good way to characterize uh, characterize that aspect of the story. Yes, I think so. And of course, we we I didn't have time to go into those um, to the. the to her her help the people who work for her but yes her um uh giving them that cold water is like spraying down her hogs you know she she just she and and again it's all yes. about her she's the cleanser she she's a uh, and and she can put everyone below her especially those who are different from her mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah another question why do the black people have to be dressed in white robes that's that's pretty traditional right wouldn't you say uh, oh, yeah. and and depictions of people going to heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's from yeah. Revelations too. Right. Yeah. Right. And another comment, really some insightful comments coming in here. The purpose of the pig parlors is to keep the animals trapped. That's what she wants to do to people: keep them trapped, keep them contained in their little social categories. Uh, I thought that was really insightful. Yes, I, she does want to keep them trapped. But of course, the other thing, remember that she says, is their feet don't have to touch the ground again. Mm -hmm. Um, Ruby wants everything associated with her elevated. You know, if she's going to have a farm, it's going to be the perfect farm where even the hogs are uh, don't get dirty. There, there is also that sense of who is dirty and who is stinking. And, and and of course, the white trash woman and the use of the word trash throughout here. You know, the white trash woman is the only one who knows trash when she sees it and doesn't sugarcoat it. So she's <laughs> wonderful in that sense. Yeah. We have another interesting question. Do you think Flannery O'Connor is making some social commentary by having a doctor sedate the spiritually sensitive Mary Grace? Um, I I think yes. I think one of the, one of the things that's happening here is she's saying modern science um, will see uh, a sense of the spiritual, a deep and angry sense of the spiritual, as a psychological aberration. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 try to cure it with drugs, 
that's that's part of what she felt like she was battling as a writer who believed in the spiritual dimension was the refusal of healers. You know, the doctor is supposed to be a healer to even understand there's anything to heal Mm -hmm. in a different way. Yeah, that theme runs throughout some of her stories, it, uh, several of them. You've got it in The Lame Shall Enter First, mm-hmm. and you've got it in uh, Good Country People. Isn't Joy uh, Holga, isn't she a psychologist or studying psychology? Yeah. Yes, she yeah. is. Yeah, yeah and you know, kind of modern science comes in for a lot, of, a lot of blows. Oh, yeah. Oh, it does. Well, and, of course, the intellectuals uh, yeah. that... Which, which I, I, I think O'Connor could have saw that she might have gone that way herself if she had not found um, the, the underpinnings for her faith. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We've had several comments. If we could move from the stories we've been dealing with this evening to the mm-hmm. story, Everything That Rises Must Converge. We've had some yes. questions about that. And yes. uh, one of our participants noted that it's a very uh, teachable story. And another uh, had a particular question, let me see if I can find it here, about the uh, hats. Yes. Women raising. Ah, here we go. Uh, could you comment on everything that rises must converge in some of the issues O'Connor raises with the hats and the two women who wear them? I want to take a crack at that one. Sure, and I think that is a. I think that's one of her most teachable stories today. I think it's a very useful story because uh, we have two different kinds of bigotry here. One, of course, in the mother who. Um, finds that she's wearing a hat just like the black lady's hat. The interesting thing being, of course, that that um, there's a convergence here. Uh, and yet notice the, the mother, who is supposed to be the bigot, her son certainly thinks she is, 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 is um, with all her sense of superiority, yeah, it, it, she is in many ways very innocent. Uh, in, a, in a sense that, of course, Julian is not. So we have the hat that ties the two mothers together uh, and ties them across their their very separate races. Uh, and and yet then we also have, of course, the the whole situation on a bus. And we have Julian, and I and I think we lose sight of this that he is sitting next to the. Uh, the very high class black man uh, that Julian is only too happy to talk to as an equal, but of course he isn't really seeing him as an equal at all. Uh, he is just a way for Julian to, to show his mother up um, and to to assert his own superiority. So we got two pairs here, okay? And we also, of course, have the the, the uh, a mother two mother-son pairs as all, and uh, so the story attacks racism as a sense of superiority and a sense of separateness uh, that I think works beautifully. Um, Julian is left uh, bereft because he's bereft again of the same things the, the grandmother is in A Good Man is Hard to Find. He's, he's left with all those underpinnings uh, that have made him feel superior in a way that his mother never even worried about. Uh, and yet, what is we see? He's 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 regressed into infantile paralysis, really, uh, by the end of the story. So that's some of what I make of it. Okay, we have another story too. People have raised here the story Greenleaf. Um, oh. Would you say that some characters like Ruby reject that grace? Uh, does Mrs. May in Greenleaf also fail to accept? And then another comment about Greenleaf, talking about uh, vision and the theme of seeing things. Uh, what about her use, Flannery O'Connor's use of the tree line, the limits of vision in the story Greenleaf? Uh, Mrs. May is smug, and the sun will sink below the tree tree line. Uh, is, is, is smug um, in the way that she thinks the, the sun will sink beyond the tree line the way it always does. You want to comment on Greenleaf? How, would you, how teachable would you say that is? Well, I kind of like Greenleaf because I think it gives us, uh, gives us one of our most villainous characters in, in Mrs. May. I mean, she, she is pretty much ir- irredeemable, uh, and, and, and the revenge that is taken on her is, is especially fitting. Um, we don't see her uh, having a vision of anything but confusion 
okay? She's not like the grandmother that makes the gesture that a violent moment has given to her. So she's a good contrast with that. And she's also, she's just unrem unremittingly small-minded. Uh, and, and I do think O'Connor makes a good use of, of vision and limits of vision in that story. She uses the tree line in the woods a lot. She's going to use it in another story that's uh, really quite remarkable, uh, the one about good fortune. Um, that has the granddaughter and the grandfather. That's a particularly gruesome story as well. Um, but but the idea of the tree line, I think, uh, in any of her stories is, as we have to understand when we're driving there down the road, you know, that we're hemmed in by the trees on either side, uh, that tree line almost always is there as also a tag to say the world is a whole lot bigger, deeper, and multi-layered than what you are able to see, where you see the trees as being the flat end of the line. And and certainly for Mrs. May, um, that's a you know that that limit of vision is is. And of course, what's going to come out of that tree line is the black force of of all that she absolutely refuse to see in her dealings with other people. She's a we, pure villain to me. And we, ha we have another question here. How much do you think Flannery O'Connor is concerned about the loss of the Old South in her stories? At least her hypocritical characters seem to be concerned about it. I, in, I have to say, if I'm going to make a comment here, one of the things that struck me in rereading these stories is that Flannery O'Connor South from the mid-50s, the South has changed drastically, of course, since the 50s, but you can still find Flannery O'Connor South in the South. I mean, it's, 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 it's not everywhere, but still, it's there. I mean, when, you know, um, today the, the, the plantation that the grandmother wants to find is either not there or it's an historic site, uh, so the plantations are gone, but the you could still, um, you know, find the doctor's office, and and you could. I'm, I'm, I guess my point is that this, the, the, her focus is so still so narrow. It's not she's not considering the broad mythic South. I think the way Faulkner might. Her focus is still right. narrow enough that you can still see pieces of it, slices of it. Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I would, and I would also say that that for her, in some ways, the old South, new South dichotomy was. Um, a dichotomy between uh, a world that accepted manners and rituals uh, a as an overlay to violence as opposed to uh, a New South world where everything just is whatever. You know, um, it's a world where people made, uh, 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 in, their, in their behavior, they could lean on ritual and manners to, um, to communicate uh, in a way that allowed them to, uh, in in some ways deal with with their own uh potential for violence and evil uh and and so uh the plantation can come to stand for order uh and also of course for a belief system that of, of course is a failed and flawed one uh and and needs uprooting as well, I don't think she's mourning the loss of the old South at all. But she is. She, I think, she likes to use people who believe in the old South as people who do believe in uh, a ritual and and in a kind of uh, a, a, a mannerly way of getting above the literal. Um, mm -hmm. So, so that's that's some of the things I think that are going on with that. Mm -hmm. Getting above the literal. Yeah, yeah. We have a comment here. Does our emphasis on vision or lack of vision perhaps speak to a larger misreading of what the South actually was and is, like in the grandmother? Uh, that site may be more important. That site may be important not only for the characters, but our beliefs and perceptions as readers. Yes, yes. I, th I think that's uh, uh, because in some ways I think she's embedding us as readers into the story. She's asking us to make the same leaps of sight. Uh, and then she's trying to shoot us every minute of our reading as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. to uh, to get get to get to a different level of sight. And I think she, uh, the more aware the reader is of sight issues and blindness, the more the reader is likely to uh, to come to a new perception of of 
their own sight as a reader and mm-hmm. insight into what the story is trying to say. And of course, for her, that might even elevate itself to a different, uh, a newer level in which the story itself becomes an agent of change and an agent of grace in the reader. Right. Brings us to our own epiphanies. Right. Right. Well, I thought we were going to go over, but we didn't. In fact, we're seeming to wrap up a little early. Um, any final questions? Uh, any 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 last things before we we bring our discussion here? Uh, let's see. We have a comment. Reminds me of the Dutch who went to South Africa. They felt they were uh, chosen, and the blacks were underneath them. They believed that this came from God, like so many people in this country. Not only the South felt. Well, yes, that's true. An apartheid society. Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments before we wrap things up? Okay, I want to thank all of you. This You've participated wonderfully. You've had some really insightful comments and questions, and I want to thank all of our participants. And Cindy, I want to thank you for giving us a, a really wonderful seminar. One of the participants said, uh, we'd like to sit down with you and talk with you for hours about Flannery O'Connor, and, and we might be able to do that. Maybe we'll do another O'Connor seminar with a couple of other stories. Maybe oh, we'll look we at everything that rises. Yeah, yeah I'd, that like would... to, I'd like to bring in, uh, because in some ways so many people think she's a, a kind of one-note writer. Yeah. That she had the same thing going on and all, and it would be really nice to to take some new looks, you know, at um, and new ways to to read her, especially for 21st century uh, yeah. uh, audience who she has a lot to say to. Uh, think of the Cohen brothers and Tommy Lee Jones and, and yeah. Cormac McCarthy are still finding new ways to use her her thinking. Well, there's there are some seminars, and I, and I hope if we if we do this, I hope all the people who signed up tonight will join us once again. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you very much once again for your participation. Let me remind you of your evaluations. Please get those into us. In the meantime, since we have a lot of English teachers on the line here, let me tell you that our next seminar is on November 15th. It will be teaching Bartleby the Scrivener, and then we have another literary seminar coming up on December 13th, teaching Hemingway's In Our Time. So please join us for those. Again, thank you all very much, ladies and gentlemen, and good evening.